1 Peter chapter 2. As we continue through this portion of scripture, as we're learning how to live as Christians in a non-Christian country. Now, so far, we have learned to remember our place, that we are citizens of heaven. We're to, while we're here, we're to abstain from sin. We're to behave like citizens of the heavenly kingdom and heavenly country. We also have learned to submit to all the ordinances of rulers because God is the one who has established every one. The only time we must say no to governing authorities is when they would lead us to sin and to disobey the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are commanded by the word to to preach the gospel and the, the world says, do not preach the gospel, we are to preach the gospel. We def- we are to follow the example given to us by the apostles. We must profess we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, as we continue as aliens and strangers in the world, we're taught further in 1 Peter and verse 16 that we are to live as free slaves. We are to live as free slaves. It says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Here we're called to two opposing positions, free and slave. That word servant is the word for slave. Now, how is it possible to be both free and be a slave at the same time? In 1800, England, buying and selling of slaves came to an end through the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833. In America, under the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, the move to abolish slavery gained steam through the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. At that time, this began as a gradual movement, even when the proclamation was made, not every slave was given their freedom. Uh, Many were, but some remained slaves for some time. But there were a great number who received freedom immediately after that proclamation. Now, when the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this letter to the scattered saints throughout, uh, the Romans practiced slavery. And many slaves were from nations that the Romans had conquered. Uh, Much of their economy, their cultural practices, their social practices included the use of slaves and servants, many of which were slaves having been bought and sold. And uh, slaves were not given citizenship. In fact, many of them were viewed as being non-person. The slaves were not protected under Roman law from abuse. They were not protected from sexual exploitation. So many of the women who were slaves were used as, a, as prostitutes in temples. There was uh, no freedom from being beaten and tortured and even execution of something that would be allowed against a slave. In rare instances, a slave could gain their freedom. And if a slave was granted freedom, they were then granted all the rights all the privileges of a free person, and they were then protected under the law of the land. If for some reason the master gave them freedom and made them even a member of his own family, they were then given the same rights as someone born into that family, including the rights of inheritance. Uh, They were also expected as free persons then to obey the laws of the land like everyone else. If that person, while being granted freedom, If they committed a crime, they would then be charged and and receive the just punishment, just like any free citizen of Rome. And this is what Peter is using to illustrate the life of a Christian, the life of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 16, where he says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness or, or evil, something that is sinful. How are we Christians free? How are we free in Christ? Well, let's turn to uh, John chapter 8 for a few moments. The Gospel of John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. The 
John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. So we read these words. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then, you are, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How do you say then that you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, as Christians, our freedom, our liberty, is spiritual. The Jews Jesus was talking to here in this chapter, they thought that they were free and they based it upon being related by blood to Abraham. That was what made them consider themselves free. He says, we've never been bondage, under bondage to anyone. Now we know that they had been as a people in bondage many times throughout their history. But they were thinking in terms of the fact that nobody has any mastery over us, no power. We are the blood of Abraham. And Jesus testified here that one is not made free through the blood of Abraham, but someone else. They are made free through the blood of the eternal Son of God. Made free, free through his blood. We have through Jesus Christ, it's by the power of God, we have been set free. What have we been set free from? We've been set free from sin. We've been set free from death. We've been set free from the devil. These things, death and the devil and sin, they're no longer our masters. We have a new master. And as this new master has taken us and brought us into his, his home and into his kingdom, he brings us in as slaves, but we are free, set at liberty. And that liberty we have is not, therefore, to be used as a license to sin. It's no longer a master. We're no longer to do what is contrary to the will and the law of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though we're free, free in Christ, that does not mean that we have the freedom to sin. But rather, we have freedom from sin. Again, sin is no longer our master. Death is no longer our master. The enemy is not our master. Christ is our master. Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanks that, thank that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which we believed and delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. There was a time in which, before you were saved, you were a servant, a slave. A slave to sin. And in that slavery, you were then delivered. Delivered by Christ. You were set free from that master. Made free from sin. But you became another slave. The slave of righteousness. The slave of Christ. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul was warning the church in Galatia, that verse that I've just read, to not get tangled up by those who are seeking to bring them under the law of Moses. The saved are no longer under the curse of the law. We're no longer under the bondage of it, but we're set free under the law of Christ. And in the, under the law of Christ, we now are slaves to him, slaves to his holiness, slaves to his righteousness, slaves to Christ. And so with that, Freedom that we have in Christ, freedom from sin, comes responsibility. There's an obligation given to us in our freedom. And it is given so that Christ's name and Christ's person is not held with reproach. This is because the Lord Jesus is our master. Whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think, it is to reflect who our master is, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Yes, we're free men and women, but as free, we are at the same time slaves to Christ. Also in Galatians 5, 13, it says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Whether it be in the church or whether it be in the world, the Christian has been set free not to sin. Rather, to live as slaves of Jesus Christ. Let me ask each one of you here this morning and also on Zoom, who do you serve? Who are you serving? Who is your master? Again, the term servant in verse 16, King James is, is sometimes translated as slave, but also translated as bond slave. Now, to be a bond slave meant a person who serves a master until they pay off their debt. The context of a bond slave, though, does not work in this verse and in the context of this statement here, because not one of us could ever, ever pay off the sin debt, no matter how long we worked for it, or no, no, no matter how much we paid we could not pay off the sin debt. Only Jesus had the power and also the ability as the sinless Lamb of God to pay that debt for us. And he did so on the cross. So the context isn't a bond slave. The context means a slave that has been bought. It's not a servant trying to buy their way out. It's the context of a slave that has been purchased. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Now in our portion in Peter, what Peter is really saying to the Christian, saying to the strangers and the pilgrims and the citizens of heaven that if under the pretense you're being free from sin and the kingdom of darkness, that you then live a life in sin, that you live in such a way that your witness for Jesus is poor, then you're not serving Christ. You're not showing that you're a slave of Christ. If you live like the world and you claim liberty, that you use it as a cloak, a covering, a uh, something that you're hiding, a veil, as a pretense, an excuse to sin, says you're not a slave of Christ. And therefore, Peter, he exhorts the Christian, he's exhorting us as aliens and pilgrims that while in this world, we are, have been set free from sin, we have been set free in Christ, the truth has set us free, as a free person in Christ, therefore, do not any longer act like the world. Don't claim, some claim in the world, diplomatic immunity. Instead, remember who you belong to. Remember who bought you with the price of his own precious blood. Who purchased you. Live as free in Christ as a slave of Christ. Live honestly, righteously, live in such a way that you're your life is a message of the gospel, and it's both seen and heard, that the world knows who your master is. It's not sin, it's not self, but God. And this isn't only for when we're here in the church body together. This is not just even when we're out in the world in our workplace. This is right in our own homes. Slaves to Christ. Slaves to to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not an excuse when we are set free to live any other way. We're called to live as slaves of our Lord and our God. And this is evident as we obey the next verse, where we are called to fulfill the law of Christ. We're to fulfill this glorious law, this beautiful law of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17, it says, honor all men or all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, if you were asked to summarize the law of Christ Jesus, 
Do you know what you would say? Do you know how you'd answer? Um, we, we know that uh, at times that we often have our own perception of, you know, a person who, who we look at and we think, well, they're sure uh, Holy Joe, you know, how they've referred to people like that. And, uh, there are some that people say are too heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. Well, it might be because they don't truly understand what it means when we ask the question, what is the law of Christ? Romans 13 verse 7 gives us a little understanding of what this is. It says, there, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. I'm speaking of the law of Christ. To honor all men or all people means just what it says. All people. Every single person. We must honor each one. We may not agree with every person. We may not even like every person. We know that there are wicked and evil people in the world, and we're not in honoring that. We're not honoring the, the wickedness. But there is to be a sense in which we show honor to all. Honor means we see the, and recognize the, the human value, the God-ordained human value, that God was their creator, he has created all. Again, doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to the wickedness of, of people, but even the greatest sinner is to be seen as a creation of God, created in the image of God, though marred with sin. Without showing this honor, we could never go into all the world and fulfill the Great Commission. If we did not go with that honor, this aspect of honor, how could we preach the gospel to every person? Now, the Apostle Peter, he had been taught something by God that helps us understand this truth. He was brought to learn something that was so far removed from his cultural and his religious upbringing. In the Old Testament, the Jews looked upon the Gentiles as unclean. And you did not go into their houses. You did not eat with them. Or you could do, if it was possible, do commerce with them, make money off them. But to associate with them as being equal with you, uh, having them in fellowship with you, uh, that was out of the question. In fact, they were taught under the Mosaic law that the, that the Gentiles were unclean. And one day Peter was on the top of a housetop and he was asleep and he had that vision where God let down a tarp full of animals that were considered unclean. And the Lord commanded him to, to get up and to kill them and eat these animals. And Peter he objected. He, he said, no, Lord, I cannot. Those are unclean. But God repeated the command. And in the morning... Peter went into the house of a Roman centurion and he preached the gospel to, to this Roman and his household. And by God's grace, they believed and were saved. But as he entered into that house, the Gentile house, Peter stated this in Acts 10, 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit any one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Our intentions uh, uh, among unbelievers is that they see and hear from us a proper respect as humans. To see them that they are not to be viewed as you're common and unclean. Therefore, I cannot come to you and preach the gospel to you. Yes, people are sinful. We're all born sinners. But we were, we were sinful. Yes, there are haters of God. Yes, but so were we. Prideful, selfish, 
weak people, lovers of the world, and the things of this world. Yes, but so were we. Showing honor here is kin of showing Christ. Showing honor is having the mind of Christ who when he looked upon the people, he had compassion upon them. It turns hatred into honor. With that honor, we, we also love one another and we love one another, especially as it says in the body of Christ in the church. This does not mean that we do not love those outside of the church, but the word of God gives to us a special bond. The Spirit of God unites us together with a special bond. The love of God, the Holy Spirit, spreads in our hearts. In the love of Christ, we're bound together in, in, in love. And this is such a powerful thing that when two enemies are born again, they not only become friends, but become brothers or sisters who love each other because of the love of Christ Jesus. Often in her talks, Corey Ten Boom told this story. She said, it was 1947 and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter bombed out land. Because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. After the talk, people stood up and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next, oh, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. I fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course, but I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there, but since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I'd like to hear it from your lips as well. And again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. With tears, I cried, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. That is only something possible through the grace and mercy of God, and the power of God. This love between enemies now becoming brothers and sisters in Christ.
We hear of stories like that even to this day in places where there has been battles between one ethnic group and another ethnic group. And then there are those who are converted and they come together and they love one another. Romans 12, 20 says, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Ephesians 4, verse 2, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. This is the fulfillment of the law. Honor all, all people and love one another. Brothers and sisters, that love that one can have toward a former enemy, again, it only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Were we not at one time his enemies? The enemies of God? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ Jesus loved us. He gave himself for us. Even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is his love for us. that The Holy Spirit spreads in our hearts at our new birth. It is this love we're to have for one another in the church family. And then Peter adds in verse 17, fear God, honor the king. So we're to honor all persons, all people. We're to love the brotherhood. We're to love one another as Christ has loved us. And we're to fear God and honor the king. It's not coincidence that these two statements are placed together, fear God, honor the king, nor is it coincidence in the way that they're presented, the fear God first and then honor the king. We are first and foremost in the face of unbelieving kings, unbelieving rulers, an unbelieving world, we are not to fear man, we're to fear God. Though we're, we're to obey all the ordinances of man, as it says earlier, as we looked at last week, our first and our highest allegiance is to the Lord our God and Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings. For a Christian, this fear, it doesn't mean that we need to hide in terror from God. If you're saved, this isn't where we have that fear of his wrath upon us, to view him as a God coming at us, with that wrath, because that's, that's been removed through Christ. We're no longer under condemnation. We do not need to fear condemnation if we are slaves to Christ. For the Christian, we have what we could maybe call a calm fear. It's something that is not found anywhere else in the world. If you have fear, there's usually no calmness there. But for a Christian, we have a calm fear. This is a reverential fear. And it remembers that God is God. So reminding to our hearts that yes, he is our father, but he is also a consuming fire. He has the power to give life. He has the power to destroy life. And as Jesus said, don't fear those who can harm the body, but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And so while we are living in a non-Christian country, in a non-Christian world, we would say, where there are those who would seek to come against the church, and we know in some countries they face death every day, the Christian is called upon, don't fear them, fear God. This fear leads us then to live as salt and light in this world. Fearing God in this way leads us to hate sin. If we do not have a right perception of God, then what will keep us from sin? But 1 Timothy 5.20 says, Those that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. There's a fear of, of God that leads us to turn from sin and walk righteously in this world. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. 
It is in fearing God that we then put earthly rulers in their rightful place. And how we respond, whether they make good laws or even laws or go against the, against the church, against the people of God. Our first place is fear God. And then in fearing God, with the rulers in the rightful place, knowing that it is God who has instituted all the powers in the world, then we have show honor. For example, you can consider David, who before he was king, he feared God. And when he had the opportunity to, to take Saul's life, he showed honor by leaving Saul in God's hands. Daniel's three friends, they feared God. And they, in fact, whether Nebuchadnezzar wanted to recognize, recognize this or not, they honored the king by not bowing down to the golden idol, the statue. Paul feared God by preaching the gospel. He honored the rulers by preaching to them the truth of the gospel, such as Felix, and Festus, King Agrippa. He did so with boldness, he did so with courage, but also with grace and compassion, showing honor that they were to hear the truth that sets them free, hoping that by their witness they would come to believe and know that Jesus Christ is Savior. So as we live as free slaves of Christ, we do so fulfilling the law of Christ. And as we live and work in this world as strangers, as pilgrims, as aliens, we are taught that in our day-to-day -day lives, we are to do so with joy. We are to live without complaining. In verse 18, it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to the froward. Or froward, be unreasonable. The word fear in this verse means with respect. If we were to take a survey at your house or where you work, where you go to school, and we might even add where you attend church services, and one of the questions on the survey asked, is this person an encourager or a complainer? What do you think most would answer? Anybody want to? No. Nobody wants to answer that, right? Okay. Oh, he or she is the best worker. Does their work well? Does an honest day work? And never complains about it. Or would most answer, this person is always complaining about the jobs they're given, complaining about other workers, complaining about the boss, and so on and so on. Remember what it was that led to the Lord disciplining the people of Israel as they were in the wilderness, and even while they, because they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness? It was not only idolatry, which they committed. It was not only fact that at times they just were unsubmissive. One of the major things was they complained. They continuously came to Moses complaining and complaining. Why did you bring us out here to die? We should have stayed back in Egypt as slaves there so that we could live and eat and just die in that situation rather than hunger and thirst out here in the wilderness. Complaints. And this word servant in verse 18 is not the same word in verse 16, where verse 16 it is slave. Here in verse 18, it is the word servant. And some people say that this verse is supporting having slaves and that if you're a slave, you need to be content with your lot. But that's not the case. A servant in this verse, this context was a person who worked for another person and would most likely have been paid because they did have slaves, but they also had employed servants, people who would work on a farm, 
people who would work in a city, they were paid. Today, we would use the term employees and employers. So we would say employees be submissive or subject to your employees or workers submit to the orders that your boss gives to you. Basically, the, when it talks about being subject with all fear, this is a phrase that means not only just being submissive in doing the thing, but also in heart and attitude without complaint. Don't be a complainer if your boss tells you to clean the bathroom, thinking, you know, that's, that's below my pay grade. Um, don't be a complainer. Do the work that God has given you to do. Now, basically, the summary of this verse is just as we've been called to be the best citizens of our country, the best citizens our country can have, so we're called to be the best workers, say, a business can have. And note that it does not hinge on the type of person the boss is. We always like an easygoing uh, boss. You know, we like a boss who does not raise their voice, one that gives a good bonus at Christmas. Um, it's more difficult when it's a person not easy to get along with, one who maybe is unrealistic in their expectations and when they don't praise you for a job well done. Even those masters, he's saying here, those you work for, they're to be shown the proper respect, the proper honor, because again, their position's sake. And the scripture says that all those in authority have been placed there by God. That, in, that doesn't include just the emperor, the king, president, or prime minister. That includes all levels. And so as we live and as we work in this world, even though we know that this is not our home, even though we know we're aliens, we're pilgrims, that we are looking for a city in heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to work in such a way that they see and they hear Jesus in us. Even in the way we do the menial tasks. Don't steal from your boss. That includes time. Don't talk bad behind their backs. Give them an honest day's work and do it for the sake of Christ. Do it for the, the glory of God. Do it for your master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of that we've looked at so far, how to live in a non-Christian society can be summed up with the phrase, live your life to please God. Live your life to please God. No, verse 19. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Or what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Now, what should be the summary for our lives as Christians living in a non-Christian country, in a world that is hostile to the gospel, where we will face, as Jesus said, tribulation. We will face different forms of persecution. How do we live? How do we suffer in a non-Christian country. Well, we're told here we're to endure it and to do so patiently and live our lives seeking favor, not from man, but from God. Seek to live patiently your life in Christ. Note at the end of it says, this is acceptable with God. We want to live a life that pleases him that he accepts. If we respond to our suffering, if we're not loved by the world and those in our country hate the gospel and we find ourselves viewed and treated as enemies or as strange because we believe in and, and we love the Lord Jesus, how should, we, how should we live? How should we respond? Do so patiently, endure it as a believer, Endure it as a slave of Christ and do so with a desire 
to please the Lord, to live and act in such a way that is acceptable to God. That should summarize our whole life. It should summarize our whole attitude. Paul lived this truth. When writing to the church in Corinth, he said in 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 11, to the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, though, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuge or the garbage of all things. As children of heaven, we are not given license to respond to evil with evil. We follow the example of the likes of Paul, who when they would swear and curse at him, he would not do so back to them. He would not respond in kind. He would not swear and curse them in return. In fact, he says in that verse I read, when reviled, we bless. Now that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Humanly speaking, I, I, I'd find that impossible. We need, that, of course, the help of the Holy Spirit. Depend upon him to enable us to bless somebody who reviles us. And as they carried on, they were persecuted, persecuted by the world. And he says, we endured and we did so patiently. When slandered, they spoke kindly. When, when harassed, they continued to preach to them the gospel of God's grace. They always pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, who it said of here in 1 Peter 2, verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There was a song that was written by a Canadian pastor for a Bible camp that he was going to be a speaker at. And after that, it actually became well known in the 70s. And the words are these. He says, Lord, make my life to be like the man of Galilee, with love and charity to all I meet, to walk in holiness, kindness, and meekness. Into his image, Lord, I want to be. If pride be in my life, some unclean thought or word, or some unchristian deed, cleanse me, I pray. Renew my life each day to walk in Jesus' way and grow in purity, revealing the Lord. Into his image, transformed each day. Into his image, mold me, I pray. Fill every part of me, guiding me constantly, having control of me. O oh Lord, I pray. If we're being transformed into the image of Christ, one of the images of Christ that we mirror and are called to mirror is the fact that when we are reviled, when we are treated poorly, we're not to sin by treating the other person poorly. We consider Jesus our master. That Jesus, when he was upon this earth and was on that road to the cross, he didn't complain. And when he was being beaten and abused and they were mocking him, he did not mock them back. He did not revile them. He did not curse them back. But he prayed, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Our Savior, our Master, lived a life that pleased his Father completely and we are called and with the strength of the holy spirit and the power of the word of god we are called to live a life that is acceptable to god a life pleasing to him whether in our homes you know doing dishes or or before kings and governors whether we're on a trip to a tropical island or 
a job, maybe working at a dump. We are to live as the slaves of Christ. And we're to remember we belong to our master in heaven and our lives are to testify to the truth that we are not in the world for our own glory. We're in the world for the glory of Christ. That we are strangers and pilgrims and we're headed to the promised land and we are while we are on that pilgrimage, we are to live as free men, free women, free children of God, but as slaves, free slaves. We're to fulfill the law of Christ. We are to work without complaining. We're to live to please our God in everything and in every way. And so let this song and prayer be yours as you live in a non-Christian country into his image, transformed each day, fill every part of me, guiding me constantly, having control over me. Oh Lord, I pray. Amen.